Hey guys, it's John the Quant here. Uh, no, just iPad only today, uh, because this is going to be pretty quick. What we're doing today is we're going to add dividends to the Black-Scholes model. And if you haven't watched my video where we derive the Black-Scholes model, you really need to go back and see this because we are going to start from the middle. All right, so we're going to start from the point where we've already delta hedged. So what that means is that we have set dv ds equal to delta. And now we've got this. The value of our portfolio is equal to, this is the value of the option with respect to S, which is the stock price, and T, which is time, minus delta times S. Okay, and you can see here we've got DVDS is equal to um, delta. So what this is going to give us is that the change in the portfolio value is equal to the derivative of V with respect to T plus one half sigma squared S squared. The second derivative, second derivative of V with respect to S close parentheses there, and dt. Now, the important thing to realize is that this chunk is entirely deterministic. There is no randomness in this. So, since there is no randomness, the change in value of our portfolio has got to be the risk-free rate times p times dt. So this is the risk-free rate. All right, and that's because this is entirely deterministic. There is no risk, therefore, the return has to be the risk-free rate. Make sense? But now we have dividends, and the entire return must be the risk-free rate. So if we take our returns and call it i, okay, this is our return. Well, we're getting D, okay? Plus, we're getting the risk-free rate. So in order to have this return end up being the risk-free rate, we have to do I minus D, or in this case, R minus D, okay? So R minus D has to be our return here. So let's rewrite that now with our new uh, return. Instead of getting the risk-free rate, the change in value of our portfolio has got to be the risk-free rate minus the dividends, okay, times P dt. And that's because return must add up to risk-free rate. And we're already secretly not written here getting those dividends. So we go and plug that back into this long guy. We're going to get the derivative of V with respect to T plus 1 half sigma squared S squared second derivative of V with respect to S. Close those parentheses. DT is got to equal R minus D times our portfolio value, dt. Now, before we move on, you can see there's a dt on both sides. And this isn't exactly how it works, but we're going to cross those out. All right, we're going to say that those changes in time are equal, so they don't matter. Now then, this portfolio value, you'll recall, is v minus delta s. And that delta here, is dvds. This is from delta hedging. So if we take those into account, we can rewrite this as dvdt plus one half sigma squared s squared second derivative of v with respect to s is equal to 
r minus d times v minus, well, we'll write here delta s for now. So now we're going to distribute this through. I'm only working on the right hand side right now, so I'm not going to rewrite the left hand side. We'll have r minus d times v minus r minus d times dv ds times s. Now, we're going to move everything until it's on the same side so we can set it equal to zero. All right, my writing might get a little small here, but we've got dv dt plus one half sigma squared s squared second derivative of v with respect to s. I'm switching these places. k plus r minus d dv ds times s minus this r minus d v is equal to zero. And this right here is Black-Scholes with continuous dividends. And if you think about it, the logic that we used here, this was really all about this change, okay, where we had to be r minus d instead of just the risk-free rate. So you can really apply this, and it turns out that this function here is Black-Scholes with continuous dividends, but it is also Black-Scholes with interest, such as in Forex markets, or with the cost of carry. In commodities. Now, with the cost of carry, all right, it's a cost. You're not. You are paying it. You're not getting paid it. So instead of it being um, minus d, you're going to end up with plus. So let's let c equals negative d. Okay. So this is the cost that you're paying. So in that case, Black Scholes ends up being. The derivative of v with respect to t plus one half sigma squared s squared second derivative of v with respect to s plus now we have r plus c all right times s dv ds minus r plus c again v and that's all equal to zero because you are paying this it becomes a positive here There we go. Now, what are the assumptions? So, we have a lot of the same problems that we do with the regular Black-Scholes model. So, assumption number one is that the underlying asset follows a log-normal random walk Assumption number two is that the risk-free rate is known. Assumption number three is that the dividend or the interest or the cost of carry, all right, is constant and continuous. All right, let's call it continuously accruing. How's that? Oh, and it's proportional to the value. Proportional to the asset value. Assumption number four is that delta hedging is possible. And we do it. And assumption number five is that there is no arbitrage. And like we ran into before, every single one of these is absolutely nonsense. But, you know, what can we do? 
let's try to take this into reality a little bit. And let's just kind of look at this, not from a, you know, stochastic calculus um, theoretical point of view, but from, you know, just a, a guy who's buying some options. So the first thing to keep in mind is that dividends are rare these days, or maybe not rare, uncommon these days. A lot of companies are foregoing paying dividends in favor of just trying to raise stock prices. Now, also, those that do pay dividends generally pay quarterly in the U.S. and semi-annually in the U.K., And that is pretty far from continuous. Let's write that here. Not continuous. Now, dividends are typically... We're going, I'm in the U.S. Dividends are in dollars per share. Not percent of value. Or percent of price. And dividend amounts are dividend amounts are not publicly known. Prior to payment. Now working with this much uncertainty into a model is really complicated. So it's usually best to take baby steps, and that's what we're going to do. We will, over time, work our way up to you know more sophisticated and powerful models. But right now, we are going to take baby steps. So let's see what we can do about assumptions. So our assumptions here. Let's assume, okay, to make this easy, we know the dollar amount of the dividend beforehand. Okay, so it's a, or we have a deterministic function to determine the dividend amount. Okay, we either know it or we can find it. And then number two, dividend is paid discreetly. which is realistic, hooray. Number three, we know the payment date. Now, this one in the middle is realistic, that's great. These two on the outside, not so much, but this is where we are with our uh, ability to handle the randomness and complexity, okay? So now we're on a timeline here, and we know that in the middle of this, we're gonna get, uh, say, a $20 dividend. So since we know that we're about to get a $20 dividend, we're gonna buy right here, okay? So we're gonna buy this and say we paid a hundred dollars for it and then we get our dividend and we immediately sell okay and we're gonna sell it for a hundred dollars immediately after so this is on a very very small time frame so let's look at our cash flows first we had a negative one hundred dollar cash flow then we had a positive twenty dollar cash flow then we had a positive one hundred dollar cash flow add that up and we made 20 bucks. Risk free. Which of course is nonsense. You can't do that. So what's keeping people from doing this and creating this kind of arbitrage? So let's set up that timeline again, okay? And we know that at the middle we're getting a $20 dividend. 
And now, well, we know that afterward, unrealistic, but uh, let's say we buy it for $100. Okay, so let's look at these cash flows. We have minus 100 here, then plus 20. Now what do we need to sell for to make this a no arbitrage situation? Well, that's easy enough, it's 80. We need to sell for $80. That way everything adds up to zero and we get no arbitrage. So that's what has got to happen. For no arbitrage to hold, we need it to be such that the price and when ap approaching the payment time from the right, okay, is equal to the price when approaching the payment time from the left minus the dividend, okay? This price has to equal this price minus the dividend. That is the only way to avoid arbitrage. So if you look at this on like a, like a graph, say this is our stock price here, and then dividend, what you're gonna see is a drop and then continuation. Okay, the dividend was paid here and the drop is the amount of the dividend. This is called a jump condition because it causes the price to jump. All right, jump conditions are very important in uh, finance and they're very cool and we're gonna deal with them a lot going forward. But that's the stock price itself. And, and the option owner doesn't get paid the dividend. An option owner's cash flows are not affected by the dividends at all. So even though we know that the price after has to be equal to the price before minus the dividend, the value of the option after has to be equal to the value of the option before. Isn't that interesting? There is no jump in the option price. So if we put these two together, we know that V of, we're just gonna refer to it as S, okay? As T approaches from the left, No, the right, there we go. Has to be equal to V of S minus D. Does that make sense? Because we know that these things hold. You're right, I got that backward. There we go. Always pay attention to your signs, people. So what does this mean for the option value? And this is best, this is easiest to understand by looking at a graph. So we're gonna have the value be on this side of the graph, and we're gonna have the stock price be the x-axis. Now originally, our original stock price, we'll put this in green, why not? Our original option value would be zero up to some point, and then it would start going like this. Now, after a dividend payment, the value has to be the same, even though the price jumps backward. So our value would say have to be here. And it would cause this jump This is the original. This is after dividend. This is a dollar dividend. A dividend causes the value function to jump to the left. Or 
in the case of a dividend that is the percent of a stock price, it still has to end up being the same. But because it's a percent now, we have it changes with S, so it's going to be something like a curve rather than straight. So this red one here is after a percentage dividend. So there we go. We just added dividends to the Black-Scholes model and looked at how it really affects the value of an option, um, you know, in reality. All right, so if you learned something, go ahead and hit the like button. If you want to let me know that uh, this one was not up to par, then go ahead and leave me a comment. And if you want to keep learning, uh, hit the subscribe button, and I'll see you guys soon.